Glasses Malone in the green room, man. This is a good one, man. I'm glad to be linking up with you, right. chopping it up. Thanks for having me, dog. Thank man. you for having me. For sure. It's an honor and a privilege, man. What's all love, man? We've been talking about it, so yeah. once you reached out, I was like, if a nigga hit you like twice or three times, you're like, oh, this nigga's serious. <laughs> so. Nah, that's me for sure. I respect that, man. I think um, hip hop needed a little foot in his ass to get some hustle on, so. Ain't nothing like seeing a nigga hustling, you know what I mean? That reminds you exactly of what this shit is about and the opportunities it can create for the ghetto, you know what I'm saying? For people from the ghetto. So I love it. I'm here. Facts. And that's definitely like some of that type of talk is what I would definitely want to get into because lately I feel like you've been kicking that shit like that niggas need to hear about this, the culture and shit. Yeah, shit. It, it, it was made for this shit. This hip hop shit, shout out to the Bronx, but they made this shit for the ghetto to shine. And, um, I'm sure sometimes within it, we don't like how some things look, you know what I mean? But I hope we don't grow up to a place to where we become the same people that was condemning the shit, you know what I mean, that we was listening to. So I, one of my greatest fears is that I always tell Charlemagne and different armies, like, I don't want us to become see the Lord's Tucker. You know what I'm saying? Like, seeing the sexy red and be talking shit. Like, so, you know, even if we don't understand it, hopefully we have a little bit more patience with everything. You know, Handle it with some from, compassion a little bit. Yeah, people coming from the streets, let them tell their story. And it's, it's up to us to, you know, they'll get some money, they'll get some, you know, they'll get some experience then. Facts. You originally from Watts or Compton? Watts and Compton my whole life. So my mom and dad broke up when I was a little kid. Uh, my dad remarried when I was like four. He moved to Watts. My mom stayed in Compton. So it's been back and forth the whole time. For sure. And them is just legendary places as far as L.A., you like street culture, but hip hop as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what all street urban culture is, is hip hop. So, yeah, Compton, obviously, um, everybody know about them people. But Watts, Cam, you know, Tyrese, um, different people, Whispers, you know, before, like more soul and, and hella blackness, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. If you look at Compton early on in the 50s and 60s, it was still white. You know what I'm saying Kevin Costner from Compton. Oh, okay. Shit. So, yeah, Watts is That's just crazy. hella soul. So Compton kind of brought in this dope new like era of street urban culture, you know what I mean, when it came to hip hop and Long Beach and different spots when you east of the 110 really contribute to this culture we call Los Angeles hip hop or gangster rap. Real shit. For you coming up, you know, in that area, Watts and Compton, they're both close to each other. Yeah, they neighbors. Basically. But coming up in that area. Uh, what was like probably one of your most memorable experiences coming up, like you know during them times? It's funny because where we at now, right? We we in Carson. I remember being like eleven, and the movie House Party or ten, because I think at that time movie stayed in the movie theater for like a year or two. People don't remember that because they leave now in eight weeks. But when I was younger, the movies would be in movie theaters for like months to years, and um. I remember coming over here with about five or six of my friends to the Carson Mall and watching House Party for the first time. Classic shit. And I know that sounds crazy, like as a memory, but just seeing it really took me back there. Being a little kid, my mom dropping us off, and I was watching Kid and Play for the first time dance. And I remember the shit out of that. Yeah. <laughs> just, you know just, just growing up in LA County and just, you know, hands what I'm saying? down. Yeah. All just, the different shit, just getting into the real LA experience. Yeah, man, and and. Just enjoying life, you know what I mean? Even though you're from the ghetto, you're still enjoying life. Thanks. Hell yeah. When I talked to you earlier, as you was coming in, you were saying that you was just coming from the Watts Community Center? Yeah, it's W-L-C-A-C. Okay, so um, you, you into that, like community service? No, nah, no, nah, nah. Community. <laughs> no, nah, my nigga Sticks is really into that. Shout out to Watts Sticks. Yeah, he got okay. an organization <laughs> called Think Watts. He's more into it, but I'm always down to help anybody black and from the community, period. So... I guess that made me somewhat of an activist. So they wanted to do some dope ideas and they was asking me what I'd be down. And I'm like, yeah, like I'm always down to help black people from any ghetto. I don't give a fuck from mines, you know, New York, Houston, whatever. Like, let's do it. If yeah. it's for the ghetto. Yeah, I like that. Um, listening to the new album that just came out, listening to what you said, everything. I'm getting the whole, you know, picture, you know what I'm saying, especially for the community, black folks. Hip hop, do you ever feel like you don't get enough credit for you know what you've been putting down over the years? Cause you've been you know been in the game, you really got you know some staples out here. Nah, nah, I don't, I don't think uh, 
I think as a rapper at times, maybe I could be a bit underrated. Not really, but somewhat. But no, nah, I think right now, like I, I think it's a lot to ask people to really see you when you ain't paid your dues. Mm, okay, it's, it's like an arrogance. You know what I mean? To really think people should notice you when you don't know what the fuck is going on, or you don't know what you're talking about, or you feel like you just so awesome that the world, you know, should be paying you attention. I, I think that's just this ridiculous arrogance that we have. So I never, I don't have that. You know what I mean? I, I didn't really need that. I, I think now I'm getting a lot of more respect because I paid my dues. You know what I mean? I went and did the homework. I went and did the studies. Outside of living the culture, like, I went and did a lot of homework on how to um, artistically show it and translate it to everybody else. It don't matter if you're from wherever ghetto across America, you're going to understand what I'm talking about on my record at this point because uh, I did the homework. So everything is coming now that the dues are paid and rightfully so. Thanks. You got the catalog, um, whether that be mixtape or like studio albums. Sure. First sure. studio album probably came out, what, 2011? Yep, Beach Cruise is my first Beach studio Cruise. album. But I don't want to disrespect White Lightning like it wasn't a studio album. Like my man Guido, we was in the studio making that motherfucker. It wasn't, you know, it's not 2012 where you can have an inbox and a laptop and you can get you some YouTube beats. That, it wasn't like that in 2005, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 2005, you had to yeah, have a pay producer. for music yeah. and you needed a real studio. And um, my engineer at the time, Guido the Nose, DJ GLE, you know what I mean? Same person, but he produced that first album in his studio. It wasn't like no rinky dink setup. Like I did the whole White Lightning on that tape. Yeah. You know what I mean? People don't know that shit. The reason they like the sound, that shit is on tape. And um, at that time, you had to pay for beats. Right. Could, like the song De Niro that Dr. Dre loves. Like if you heard me tell a story about the song that Dr. Dre loved and the song he thought I should be doing, you know, what made him think I should be doing music for a living is that beat cost me five thousand dollars. Yeah. Saint Denson made that that uh did Get High for Styles, the song Good Time. I get high, I get high, I get high. Same person did De Niro. Um, 200 is a song produced by Rhythm D and Chill from Compton's Most Wanted. Rhythm D did real motherfucking G's for Easy e That beat cost me 3500 Yeah. Battlecat did Take a Fade for me, for my little brother. My little brother, K-Style, paid for that. It was 2500 and that was a favor. Like, I throw you this. You know, I come in there and cook for you. It's Battlecat. Battlecat got I Love It. We can freak it. He got all these hits, but he trying to look out for a little watch nigga, so he does it for 2500 So, shout out to him because... That's how it used to be. Sure. It was exclusive. Yeah. Yeah. That was for sure below his rate. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been investing in yourself for a minute. Well, you had to at that time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, that first project, that's why I said I don't want to disregard White Lightning like it's not a studio album. That motherfucker cost probably about $20,000. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah, that was my first time. I just had the right person. But Beach Cruiser is credited as my first studio album because it's with Cash Money. For sure. You kind of got two careers in a sense because you had your like mixtape career. And then you got your, what they call the studio album. But sure. I guess when the record deals come in. Sure, sure. When somebody else paying for it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what was the transition like, though? Coming from, like, that that era was cold, too. You know, sure. I don't think that era gets enough credit. But what was the transition going from that and, and having them deals and doing deals, especially because you was doing deals with, like, Mac-10. Sure. It was, you, you came out the gate like some big heavyweight people. Well, before that, I had to deal with Sony Urban. Okay. They just dissolved it before my project could get finished or even really worked on. Um, and then I did the deal with Mac-10 and Birdman, Cash Money Records. Mm. Um, okay. It's definitely cheaper. So, okay, you was with Cash Money through Mac-10? Yeah, Okay. I was together. But before that, I had a deal at Sony Urban. But the company, Sony Urban, Sony, the record company, dissolved Sony Urban. Okay. And so I was just stuck on there for a while. And It was kind of a blessing. Sony though. Urban. Yeah, it worked out. It worked. Um, Sony Urban was a branch off of Sony. Um, Beyonce was a part of Sony Urban. Um, you know, Columbia is under Sony. I mean, it's a few artists that was under Sony, but they shut down Sony Urban. Like right after I got my deal with the person I got my deal with, Mike Lynn. So um, when I got out of that, I really ran into Mac Ten probably within the first three months of it. Yeah, and. Um, he wanted to do business. He like we was we fucked with each other instantly. Like we both come from a culture like heavily, you know what I mean? He's he's a hell of a low ride dude. You know what I mean? He knows car shit like impeccable. 
he understand the, uh, the way you're supposed to see the culture better than most people. Um, and we just hit it off, you know what I mean? The way we just clicked was like crazy. He just, he just really showed me a lot of love. And one of the first people he sent the music to was Birdman, okay. Cash Money. And that's how I ended up doing the deal with Cash Money and Birdman. Okay, so Beach Cruiser, the first album was through Who Banger? So it's through Who Banger Cash Money Records. Okay. Uh, and then uh, y'all also did an album together. Yeah, Mac and Malone. Yeah. Um, that album was dope, though. You know what I mean? Like, um, Mac kind of changed it up. Shout out to Mac 10. He changed it up. Um, but the original idea of that album, I told a story that was like uh, hella dope. It was like in four acts, five acts, how I did the music. It was... Um, the f like we had sold so much dope because me and Mac had that in common. We both sold dope. Like I sold a lot of charm and fuck with some rocks and he sold a lot of dope. So I thought that was a good angle for both of us to talk about our life in the streets. And um, the way I, I wrote the album was very much like uh, we sold so much dope that the cartel let us be the first two black members of the cartel. <laughs> so if you hear the original version of it, which I'm, I'm probably going to release and Mac gonna probably be on my ass, but he'll let me do it. He 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 respect more artistic presence enough, you know what I mean? Long as he making some money. But it was like the first act was it was a celebration, you know what I mean? Songs like Winning, um, all these dope songs was first, and then it was back to business. It was told in four acts, and it was dope, the original way. But then he kind of restructured it from a musical aspect, and I don't think I was really strong there as a songwriter at that point like um the sonics of music i just knew how to tell a story so i can structure it all based off the story and that would keep it glued together kind of like good kid man city like that's kind of how i tell stories creatively mm, that's dope right. um i think that's hella dope when, when motherfuckers take that that like cinematic approach to like the rap shit yeah. for me it was the only way i could do it you know what I mean? Now, I just started learning about the sonic part of storytelling right now when it comes to making records. Dr. Dre does that, whereas he can let an album unfold sonically. Oh, yeah. You know, Jay-Z, you know, uh, uh, um, Blueprint, you know, Scarface can tell a story sonically. I didn't know enough about music to do it that way, but I was innately a natural storyteller, so I could make words and ideas of songs flow together. And even if sonically the sonics didn't mesh, the song was so strong over it because that like you would get the story. But Mac was already had been in the business for years. So he was like, man, fuck this. Don't nobody want to hear no story and shit. And I, I still think he's crazy because I think the game is built on stories. Thanks. So, but, you know, we didn't see eye to eye about that back then, but. It was dope. Like the way the original Beach Cruiser was and the way the original Mac and Malone, they were these really dope stories. Facts. Do you ever think that Mac and Malone album kind of get lost in the shuffle when speaking on your discography or your catalog? It don't get lost. It just... So at that time, I was kind of the workhorse of the crew. Mac had pretty much paid his dues and arrived at the top spot. And it was up to me to carry the load. So um, even when he reorganized... The album, I probably should have argued with him. Like, I should have probably debated him. Mm. I mean, don't get me wrong. Mac-10 writes the checks and write, Mac-10 tells me. But at that point, if you're the workhorse, you got to know how the work is going to flow. Like, yeah, you got to own workhorse. your era. You got to own your generation. You got to own your gift. And I don't think I did a good job at that time of owning my gift in the conversation with Mac. It was like, all right, well, you want to change it? Change it. I should have argued his ass down. You know <laughs> what I mean? And Mac... Love me enough to where he would have been okay with that. For sure. Is Mac easy to work with? Yeah. Yeah. Um, he allows you to be yourself to some degree. Not as much as Bird Birdman is way more freer. Mac is still kind of tightly on it as a as a like as he's cultivating your talents. He's more hands on with it. But Birdman, he always trusted where I was at, like naturally. So, um, but Mac is easy to work with. I've worked with harder people. Sure. Mac is definitely easier to work with than most people I work with. Thanks. You got um, you got any like interesting Mac Ten stories that would probably like personify his personality to people who don't really know him, like <laughs> say something like maybe experience or something, y'all. Oh man, this is fucking funny. <laughs> Let me think. Uh, any good Mac Ten stories? Mac Ten stories. Oh, 
So <laughs> here you this is Mac 10 in the nutshell. All right. So we got a show in Palm Springs, right? We're gonna do a radio interview and a concert, like an after party for a show in Palm Springs. So we meet up, it's me and Mac 10 on the bill together. We got the little homie. I'm on the bill with him. So we go to eat after the show, right? Or no, we're going to eat before the show. So uh <laughs> we had this fire ass steakhouse. Mind you, we up in this nigga wearing some dickies. Like we looking like LA gang members, but we had like this five star steakhouse, you know what I'm saying, doing a thing. And um we up in there and head, shout out to DJ Head. So Head is Head is not a DJ, or he's just starting to DJ at this point. So we at this bomb ass steakhouse. So Head is about to order, he ordered some wine and he put some ice in it. And Mac looked at him and said, blood, you can't be embarrassing me up in here like that. That's Mac 10 in the next year. <laughs> so just <laughs> this hella hood nigga, but understand like fine dining and yeah. cuisine. Okay, okay. You feel me? Like, you can't be putting no ice in your wine, head. <laughs> nah, blood. That's Mac. Nah, that's dope though. That's a good one. Hell uh, yeah. Man, it's okay from, let me think. So who bang in? You know, they introduce you to Birdman. I'll probably get into some more Birdman shit in a minute. Sure. But when you was first coming in 2011 to 12, which I think was a dope era, uh, especially for the way you came out, uh, you was you was turning down in the, uh, you was turning down deals. Yeah, from 07 to, to to the end, yeah, I was turning down deals. A I lot mean, from big names too, though. Yeah, yeah. I didn't do a deal with Jay. You know what I mean? And a lot of people ask me, do I regret not doing a deal with Jay Z? Um, no, I don't. But I always thought it would have would have been because obviously Jay Z is one of my favorite rappers ever. Um, Turned down a deal with Atlantic, turned down a deal with Capital, turned down a deal at. It was a couple places. What about Def Jam? Def Jam turned down a deal at Def Jam. It's crazy. Not really. I mean, I think Def Jam is obviously one of the greatest labels, if not the greatest hip hop label ever. That or Cash Money. Um, but it's like the more I know about music, especially today, I should have only been signed to Interscope or Aftermath or Capital Records. Just big, right. big names. like Well, just really West Coast names mm -hmm. that really understand West Coast music. It's hard to be signed to these other companies that's trying to kind of, I don't know if the right word is subsidized, but like they trying to like make an adjustment to what's going on here, but they can't feel the pulse of the streets. Like it's really important that rappers get with producers. You know what I mean? I noticed that, like, that's a big thing with you, like, yeah, like producers. Man. Like, yeah. It all comes, hip hop is all DJ producers. Yeah. It's all DJ producers, bro. It ain't, rappers be talking about rappers putting rappers on. Man, these niggas can't do nothing but rap on a song that they can't produce. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, all major labels is built off producers. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Like, uh, the greatest labels, Cash Money is built off Manny Fresh. Death Row is built off Dr. Dre. Ruthless is built off Dr. Dre. You think Cash Money is the greatest label ever? That a Def Jam. Def Jam is built off Rick Rubin early on. Yeah. So are you partial because you was with Cash Money by saying no, that? No, I mean if you think of Cash Money records from two thousand, probably what is that? Nineteen ninety eight. Well, I mean, oh, they hit the scene nineteen ninety eight, five million sold. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And two thousand eight, they sold a million first week on Lil Wayne, and right now they got Drake and Nicki Minaj. Yeah. Pretty fucking triumphant, girl. <laughs> I ain't arguing. Okay, yeah. but look, um, with turning down the deals, like with Jay-Z, uh, with Def Jam, with all these, you're saying that in hindsight, the main thing that you was getting away from was, well, basically you wanted to always represent the West Coast properly. Music. That, that wasn't, musically. that's not at that time. Okay. At that time, it wasn't that. At that time, it just wasn't enough money. Mm. Like Jay-Z, it was... Shout out to Jay Brown. He probably cussed me out, but it was like 50000 short. It wasn't like at that time, they was offering me down there close to a million dollars, like seven hundred some thousand dollars on the advance. I mean, uh, Jay-Z was around 300000 The The Rockefeller Def Jam deal was like 300000 And I told him, just take it to three fifty. They didn't have to match the whole seven fifty at Sony. You know what yeah. I mean? Just get me to three fifty, at least, you know, so I could do the stuff I wanted to do. And um, they just wouldn't come up that 50000 And they probably was right because I didn't know nothing about hip-hop. But, I mean, I was a hell of a cultural brand at that point. Facts. Facts. So definitely the production and the business. How much was you looking for, though? Because you knew you had a lot of people. What was your number? 
I ain't really had no number at that point because I didn't all that fluff. I never listened to all that fluff, millions of dollars and shit these niggas be lying about. I never really listened to that. Um, they set all the value as people started competing. You know what I mean? They set the value. Like I knew Sony's deal was way out of pocket, like a one point seven million dollar deal where you get seven hundred fifty thousand as an advance and seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars on the album budget, and then two hundred thousand as a like a accessible marketing street budget that was, you know, for me. That was incredible, but I didn't think that was going to be normal amongst Atlantic Records or Def Jam Rockefeller. I just knew at that time that company specifically wanted the market share of Glasses Malone. Like, and I couldn't turn down that kind of money, you know, for nothing. But I did want to do the deal with Jay Z. Literally three hundred fifty thousand, I would have did the deal with Jay Z at that time. For I just couldn't do it for three hundred thousand. Yeah. Like it just, I needed more money than that at that time. Mm, for sure. Okay, um, I want to go back to when you was talking about, you know, how it was in the mixtape era when you was paying these money for all these beats or whatever. You know, back even when you said that, it stuck in my head. And even just listening to other interviews and knowing your music, how important it, the production is. Which, yeah, I didn't know that at first, though. Yeah, you know what I mean. I didn't. I didn't know how important DJing and 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 producing was in hip hop. I didn't realize that that is the genesis of it all. That's how the art initially was displayed. It was music created for people to break to. No motherfucking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you definitely don't know that as no motherfucking crib from Watts. You know what I mean? If you ain't doing your homework or you don't grow up in hip hop, you know, as far as being a rapper. Like if I read the credits in some, you know, album shits, but I didn't really know what I know about hip hop now. So. Now I understand why the Jay-Z deal wouldn't have worked. I understand why the Sony deal didn't work. I understand why different deals don't work. If you don't respect making records, you know what I'm saying, then it ain't going to work out for you. And that's what happened with Cash Money. And that's why I refuse to let Birdman like, take the blame for what happened with my career or the reason, or let him be blamed or Mac-10 be blamed for my career not being the greatest thing in the world. It's like if I would have knew about making records, if I would have gave my all the learning about this, like I did about making Sherm. Like I know how to make PCP, but I don't know how to make a record. So, you know what I'm saying? So I didn't deserve even what I got now. So, okay, but where where you at now? Do you feel like with the business, you in a good spot now? I'm in the best spot I've ever been in in my life. Okay. Is it true that you are still signed to to uh, cash money through, through um who bang? No, my deal in 2016. Okay, but it was the whole time, though. Yeah, it was there the whole time. Man, so, um, so with these songs that you was even going back from the mixtape era, you own all your uh, masters to all your all your work. Everything except Beach Cruiser. Beach Cruiser, I own half of it. The management company, Suburban Noise, that I was with, they distributed the project, so they own 50% of it. But I had that in about 36 months. Okay. But I own everything except Certified, Haters, Sun Come Up. For I sure. get dope. Even all the mixtape shit, too. Everything, yeah. I own all of that stuff. Man, streaming good, then. Uh, I mean, if streaming could be good, I don't know if streaming. <laughs> yeah, streaming is <laughs> fucked up. I mean, listen. I really think streaming should be, I don't think streaming is a horrible part of the business because I think streaming should be an added revenue to selling music. I think you have to sell music. If you're in the music business, cuz, you got to sell music. Yeah. And the one thing with the streaming, too, is like too much of the information is concealed. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's too hard to actually like really tell and put a unit on the shit. Like, you know what I mean? I don't even know. I wouldn't even know where to begin to start to talk shit about streaming. I don't really have nothing bad to say about streaming. I know that's the the general consensus amongst rappers talking bad about streaming, but I don't even know. I wouldn't even talk bad about it. I just think that business model is what it is. It only benefits uh, the parent companies, large companies. I don't even know because I don't know what nobody making. I just know that if you in the music business, or in a record business, you better be selling your shit. Right. Now, I, I, ironically, I look at streaming more like me promoting myself through Spotify. I look at streaming like me promoting myself through Spotify, like Instagram. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they just happen to pay me for promoting myself through it. I don't think it's supposed to be the major 
the most major stream of a music business revenue. Yeah. It's just um, an opportunity to promote yourself yeah. through Spotify. Yeah, I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, Aldi 300, a rapper from Texas. Yeah, I know that is. Yeah. Uh, we had a conversation about a week ago, and he was like, basically, fuck the streams, fuck the views. It's just a chance to really get your business on, you know, in a physical sense. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you. everything is all marketing to sell music. You have to sell music, especially as an independent. You know what I mean? A, a true independent, not like you signed to an independent company, but like if you spending your money, like I drove here myself. I spent whatever to put out my album. I did it. I paid for it myself. When I go in my press run, when I'm in New York and you see me on the Breakfast Club, I pay for that myself. Yeah. I pay for that flight. I pay for that Airbnb. I pay for that rental car. When I go to Atlanta, I pay for the Airbnb, the rental car. A lot of it, I'm scheduling the interviews. You know what I mean? Just based off being a solid nigga and maintaining quality relationships for years. So, you know what I mean? You cannot just depend on streaming music like. I think that's an important revenue, but I don't think it should be the most major, and I stand by that. For sure. And you don't really particularly have a, a set view on whether it's fair or not. Yeah, because I don't know. I don't really know how it works. It's interesting that ten dollars is supposed to pay millions of artists. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't know. I wouldn't even know where to start. But you know, shout out to the rappers who talk about it because I, I guess they know. I don't know. So yeah. I just know that that shouldn't be the major part. Of, that shouldn't be the most important. You know, income in your you know stream of income in your in your fold as far as independent music business. Right. You know, there's some they say some cats is getting some bread off it, but it's real real tricky, man. I mean, I would imagine whoever has the majority of the market share, they're gonna get more money than the average person is. Yeah. But I mean, I'm not. Look, it's like when I advertise my album, Cancel These Nuts. Right. It's been two months. I don't advertise Spotify. Spotify don't need me to advertise Spotify. Spotify would have to pay me to advertise Spotify, but that don't mean my album ain't on Spotify, but I advertise where I sell my music at, the Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I sell music. Shout out to Jay Prince. Shout out to the niggas who laid the foundation for hip hop and understand that we need to sell music. So I sell music. Real shit. Hell yeah. Uh, man, I got to go in on that, the Cripstore.com. As soon as you said that, it made me think like, how long have you uh, been operating under that? That uh, I guess domain. Four months. Four months. Yeah. What is? I, what I had the idea about two years ago. So what inspired that? As I learned more about marketing, and just being a cultural phenomenon on my own, and understanding what street urban culture is about, how people want to spend their money, where people want to spend their money at. Would you rather go to the Best Buys to buy my CD, or would you rather go to the Cripstore.com? <laughs> I just think if you're not whether you from inside of the urban street culture or you from the outside, the cripstore.com just seems a lot more attractive. For sure. The best buys everywhere. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think I think that's dope, but then I also I also think that like silently you're like you're putting yourself up there in the upper echelon of like crip rappers. Uh I mean Snoop is up there. Of course, for sure. Cube is up there. We consider Cube a Crip rapper. Dub C. Uh, but I don't by know. you having the Crip store, it's I nice. didn't. I never thought about it like that. But that's <laughs> funny. That's 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 a uh, that's solid. You know what I'm saying? But nah, it was just really putting on for the culture. For sure. Like my goal was eventually to have autographed copies of CDs from Trey D, autographed copies of CDs from Snoop Dogg, autographed copies from all kind of Crips. Yeah. Like, I got a, a blood story, too. I just ain't talked about it. But okay. I feel like the whole street urban culture in Los Angeles is my job to put on for it. Not just my side, but all sides. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Uh, with that culture, with that street culture, the gang culture shit, I definitely think you a good representative. That's the goal, man. I just, I, I, I want people to be proud when I'm speaking about it. You know what I mean? And when somebody is disappointed, it does bother me, but... I also got to be okay with being misunderstood too. So, yeah. it's all good. What do you think about where gang culture is at as far as relation to hip hop? You know what I'm saying? Over all the years, do you think it's a good thing? Do you think some things need to be changed? Or how do you feel about it? Because they're so tied in now. Um, I think street urban culture, I mean, hip hop is street urban culture. Um, in New York, it looked like D-Boys, right? So that's why Run DMC dressed like 
Doughboys and track suits and Adidas. You know I mean, that's the Doughboy look. Uh, I think it's always been hella influential. You know what I mean? It's just over in Los Angeles, we have Crips and Bloods, so they influence the street urban influence looks a little different. But it's pretty much the same here in New York, you know, New Orleans, Chicago. It don't matter. The streets influence hip-hop because hip-hop is the streets. Yeah. Don't mean everybody is a criminal, but the, 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 the uh, densely populated crime, you know, densely populated crime-ridden communities as that culture is developed it you know that culture becomes what you hear in hip-hop that's how you see the art displayed itself yeah i agree i agree yeah so i think it's just it's the same here or um new york i mean you people been talking about bloods and Chris, but you've been seeing uh death row and, and snoop dogg you know death row is compton you know Ma pyru and snoop dogg and Dog Pound are 20 and insane Crips. And you know, this is in 1992. Yeah. So, you know, it's 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 never gotten away before. I mean, so I don't think it's going to get in the way now. How do you feel, though, as a Cali dude, like really, really growing up in this shit where this shit comes and, and seeing how it's perpetuated so much, like, and replicated, like, everywhere else outside of California? I just think culture is contagious. Mm. Um. Shit, I mean, shit, we rap. I mean, we do, excuse me, we do, we we DJ or, you know, we, I think culture is contagious. Some of the things that, look at Lean. Yeah. That was a Texas thing my whole life. And well. one day now everybody think they own a motherfucking double cup. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? I just think some of the more contagious things fly outside of the culture. So um, you can't, like, I hold on a ghetto culture, you know what I mean? Don't get me wrong, but I don't hold it from the ghettos. Yeah. You know what I mean? Now if somebody else that's not from the ghettos try to get their hand on it and start acting like they're the culture. It's like, nah, you a fraud. But Thanks. I do think we do have I don't want to say the term influence, but I think the same reasons that make us try different things are exist in all these places. The reason why people is doing what they doing here can exist in Houston. Because they can relate. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? It's the same poverty and oppression. So of course they should be cripping in Houston or cripping in Atlanta or cripping in Brooklyn. It's the same shit. Okay. At any point, do you think gang culture has ever been toxic for hip hop? No, no, no. For sure. Because um, it's like motherfuckers was getting shot. People ask me, do I think uh, um, like the movie Colors when the film Colors came out, and they was like, oh, you know, we didn't have gangs in. My homie Mash was saying they didn't have gangs in Toledo. I'm like, yes, y'all did. He said, no, we didn't. After the movie Colors, and I'm like, no, y'all just was naming them after the street. Because <laughs> that's all gangs is. Yeah. Like, you know, Colors is not the first time a motherfucker got shot in another city. Colors ain't the first time they had cliques fighting in, in these other cities. They just retitled the name of the cliques. Or they said, okay, we're going to wear these colors like this movie. But they was already tripping. So, again, it's just relatability in the ghetto. It won't last in these suburbs. You can't go to some of these middle class, white, affluent communities, you feel me? And they gonna start being Crips and Bloods. They don't have the things needed there for you to plant it in the dirt and sprout trees from it. That ain't gonna work that way. Yeah, it's always been street organizations. It gotta be where poverty and oppression and all of those things exist for it to work. Yeah. Or, they, or it gotta be neighbored to it. Okay. Do you think it is the movies like Colors or, or other things, the thing that made the blood and the crip thing is such a staple or so replicated. Yeah, I mean, I think people got exposed to it that way and they made it a lot more digestible than it really is. Yeah. You know, it's, it's way, the real thing of gangbanging is way more nuanced. I was just at that community center we was talking about and talking to my homeboy from Grave and Bonnie and then you were here at the outskirts and think they hate each other, but they really all family. So they do fight, but then they... Friends and families, like the Twenties and the Insanes, they both Crips and Long Beach, and you would think they all fight, but no, they all grew up together too, yeah. and that's the nuanced part that's not explained in these films. Yeah, it just comes across like, hey, he's a blood, he's a Crip, they fight. Yeah, it's way my older brother is from Brim. You know what I mean? We not gonna fight. Yeah, for sure. The um the gang culture, of course, has always been a part of L.A. Everything, the music, just being an L.A. artist. When you interact with other artists and you build and you're trying to connect, does it's probably outdated for it to be like this, what I'm about to explain, but does it ever get in the way? Does gang culture ever get in the way of like 
you know, just interacting with other artists and business people? No. No? Nah. Not for the most part, no. Yeah. For it's sure. really, it's really, um, but also that could be a deep boy mentality that's, that I have inside where it's like, I've always had to earn revenue with different people from different communities. So it don't matter exactly uh, where they from. It's, can we get some money together? Thanks. So I think that transition to the music business well. Okay. Uh, random shit. Top three greatest crib rappers of all time. <laughs> shit. Uh, Snoop. Snoop, of course. Trey D, Dub C. Okay. Over Nipsey? At my list. I mean, yeah. Nipsey is my homeboy, so it's kind of like, I don't think I heard Nipsey music like everybody else. Okay. Like, it's different if you grew up listening to Nipsey music, and then Nipsey is your friend, and he got a new mixtape. You got to go to home, got a tape. Yeah. You know what I mean? I grew up kind of looking at Trey D, Snoop, and Dub C completely different. Nip was like my homeboy, so it's like, that's going to be the next generation of somebody that's 26 that's going to tell you how great of a rapper Nip is. Thanks. I could tell you how great of a nigga he was. For sure, man. I don't, I don't think like? Corrupt, Corrupt probably should be on that list too. Corrupt might cuss me out. <laughs> Corrupt is probably something right there. But I think it, if you ask Corrupt who is his top three favorite rappers, it's probably not going to be Snoop. You know what I mean, he, they grew up, Snoop probably would have a hard time putting himself in his greatest crib rapper. That makes sense. It's like when people, you're contemporary, you look at them yeah, different. Yeah. For sure. What's it like being cool with Nipsey? Shit, that nigga was funny, man. He For was a cool nigga. Yeah, man. He funny as hell. Really cool. Uh, smart, always got an idea. You know, hella com like hella confrontational. Like he will confront some shit. He be down with all the conf <laughs> all the confrontations, man. Um, but just really a good dude, man. Really, I know it sounds crazy because people say that, but just really a fun, good dude. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Always used to make me laugh. Yeah, yeah. You got any unreleased music with Nipsey? Yeah. Shit, so what's it like when you listen to that? I don't really listen to it no more. For real? You got a lot of shit, though. Nah, I only got two songs, but I, I don't really... It don't feel the same. It's hard to listen. A lot of people talk about like putting out their songs, but I wouldn't put out my songs with him. It just... It ain't fun no more now. When it was here, it's cool. We could do it. It's fun. But now it's like... It just ain't... You know what I mean? It don't have the same feeling. Shit special. Yeah. Now I don't, I don't even want to listen to it no more. You know? It's like, damn. Hearing him is hard right now. Yeah, facts. Uh -huh. I could only imagine, man. Yeah, man, he's that type of dude, man. My dad was crazy as he came to visit me at my pop's house. My pop's in the 40s, most people, you know, they real close. And I remember he jumped out, my dad saw him and didn't trip. And then when he died, he was like, is that the dude you had at my house? And he was sad. He was like, oh, man, that was sad. It's like when Nip died, it was like, you know, a lot of people just, um, they hit everybody completely different. Like, I don't think. I, even when he was breathing, I don't think he got nowhere near as much love as he did when he passed away. Yeah, like it just a, like my dad, my father was like, "Man, touch your boy." Yeah, it's like yeah, he's like man, that's sad. Definitely, so it's all bad. Thanks. I think the dopest thing about him is how much like how much positivity he spread and how many people he touched. You know what I'm saying? Like for real, for real. Man, I, you know it's funny like. Um, most niggas is like that, man. That, like, I know they say that about gangbangers, but most gangbangers are really positive dudes. You know what I mean? They, I know they have just negative connotations where niggas be like murder, death, kill, but that ain't really what it's about. Even the roughest niggas ain't like that. You know what I mean? They are really usually dudes trying to take care of their family and get their shit together. Yeah. But obviously, you know, everybody only see Rocket and Colors or High Tops, so they like, <laughs> them niggas is crazy. Cool. Dale Dog, rest in peace from Main Street, was one of the Greatest and coolest motherfuckers you will meet. Dale Dog. Yep, from okay. Main Street. Honcho from Grave Street. All these legendary names. Turtle. Ask them older niggas about Turtle from Santana, man. Everybody gonna talk about how great of a guy he was. Yeah. Most gangbangers, the ones that are like celebrated and popular, you know what I mean, that are celebrated are really great guys. As crazy as it sounds. Just have a, a rigid, more, more like code. Yeah, yeah. And it's all morality. You know what I'm saying? It's all like you got to be accountable for your own shit. If you owe somebody some fucking money, pay them their money. If you go to jail for your crime, don't tell on nobody else's crime to be, you know, unaccountable for your crime. And they stand on that. But if you a solid motherfucker, man, you would love these motherfuckers. Papa, Dad from Bonnie, on it, like all great guys. You'll love them all. They was just like outstanding dudes. I love talking to Hans. When Hans, 
came by my studio when he, you know, he came home and talking to him, just, you know, talking to Dale Dog. All them niggas is gangsters from Santana, just great guys. You'll like them. They just awesome dudes from yeah. around the way. That's what's up. Man, it stuck in my head, man. You said Nipsey was uh, super confrontational. I don't really hear a lot of people say that. Yeah, that nigga be <laughs> awesome shit. Like, if you said some little... So it's not confrontational, like, he gonna trip on everybody, but, like... But he's always... He remembered everything. Okay. And if you said something, he for sure was gonna ask you about it. For sure. For <laughs> you sure. know what I mean? I know that part ain't really spoke about it. I don't think he was in fights every other day, but, like, yeah, like, you know, he was... <laughs> like, he was on motherfucking... Uh, what was the fucking magazine or the, the outlet? Uh, uh, um, start with a C, cuz. Uh, what you talking about? He was on that outlet ass. Oh. <laughs> he was on that ass. <laughs> he like, fuck them, cuz. Uh, what's them niggas' name? They was big for a while, The too. magazine? Uh he yeah, was... uh, uh, start with a C in New York. They got uh, Complex. Okay, okay. He was on Complex ass. Oh, okay, yeah, I do remember that. When see, they had see, academics and shit. Yeah, yeah, see, but even not just that, he was just on them. Yeah, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Cubs about and, about how shit was represented. Yeah, shit. if you see him and shit when he was on the TMZ people, cuz right. <laughs> the security guard, cuz it's just crazy. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I don't think that's the part people want to talk about. Nah, that's ain't nothing wrong with that yeah. though. But I, exactly, that's how I feel, cuz like he was a man. Like if you if you if you handled his legacy fucked up, you know what I'm saying, he was gonna address you about it. Yeah. You played with him, so I like that. That was my favorite thing about good. Real shit. They're gonna turn it up on your funky yeah. ass. Real shit. K or dinner with Jay? Dinner with Jay for me. For real? Yeah. Why? I'm one of them type of niggas that could turn dinner with Jay into five million. Real shit. Everybody, I would recommend the, 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 the I would recommend the flock take five hundred thousand because he probably gonna talk about some shit you don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> right? Okay, I got you. But for me, dinner with Jay, I probably could turn that into five million. Yeah, for sure. For what, me, what would be one of the first things you ask Jay Z? I asked him some shit already, so you can ask me. If I ask him now, yeah. I'd be asking for the plug on some shit. I'd be like, hey, what's up with this? You know what I mean? I need some plug. Yeah. Could you plug me in with them? Ask them to see that phone phone Rolodex right quick. No, I don't need that. Just <laughs> plug me in with them niggas right here. You know what I mean? We'll get some money. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, dinner with Jay is worth more than that for me. Yeah, yeah. Where does Jay-Z, where does Jay-Z fit in the greatest rappers of all time for you? Top five. Top five? Right, uh, in there. Not number one? I don't know what number one look like. That'd be a bad argument. I heard that you say Snoop is the greatest rapper of all time. The greatest hip hop artist of all time. Okay, explain yeah. what you mean by that. Uh, I think he's just a cultural phenom by itself. Snoop is like, if you understand what hip hop embodies, there's never been a cultural phenom as great as Snoop Dogg. Yeah. You know what I mean, what he's brought to the world, how he's presented himself, how he stayed staunch down in the culture. Like, he never, like, he it ain't nothing X about Snoop Dogg. Snoop put on right now, Snoop going to be a crip today and he going to define cripping the way he wants to. And I think that's what hip hop is all about. Hip hop ain't about yeah, it's funny I'm going to say this and it's, I probably shouldn't but I'm going to say it anyway. I saw this interview and Jada Kids was saying like hip hop or rap was a stepping stone and I was like that was crazy to hear Jada Kids say that to me because it's like Jimmy Iovine is a hundred millionaire because of hip hop. You know, all these people like are like nine figure niggas because of hip hop. I don't think they thought of it as a stepping stone. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the it's the pinnacle it's of the, the mountain. Full you load, yeah. You feel me? <laughs> this is the most influential thing in the world at this point. I agree. I agree. I I personally believe the greatest like art form ever type shit. It, 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 between this and and that uh that Renaissance they had going to Italy at one time, it's, it's right. gonna be tough to fuck with That's, this one. Totally you know agree. Man? Totally agree. Um, I, like lately too, especially like I've been looking on the net, especially on Twitter, because you be going off. 
I look at you like right now, like almost like a hip hop crusader type of dude. Like. That's really how I feel. Okay? For real? <laughs> like hip hop Indiana Jones. Like, bro. like almost straight shit. up, bro. Real shit. I swear to God. And you enjoy that shit. I love it, dog. It's like it saved my life. First off, right? Hip hop saved my life because when I was struggling to transition off of, out of throwing my life away in the streets and selling drugs and all that, gang banging, it saved me because all my homeboys went to prison. I mean, all of them. Some of them died. Got killed. You know what I mean, it's just fucked up. Some of them on drugs. Some of them don't even come around the homies and friends no more. They like, man, they feel like they couldn't be in this life and still be themselves. And hip hop kind of saved me from going to prison, probably being murdered the same way. And um, I made so much money so fast and didn't know nothing about it. Didn't even think of it as special. Really thought of it as me robbing the game. Mm. Like I'm robbing this shit. It's a real street nigga robbing this rap shit. You know, because you hear niggas talking about it, and I don't think they really give it its true proper. You know what I'm saying? So, um, I remember there was a time one of my homeboys, my little bro Mo, Mexican cat, really dope brother, and um, he had got a job at the Long Shore as a longshoreman in Long Beach, and I was trying to buy his job. Like you know, you could buy a, a, a like a job down there. Like at one time, yeah, they could okay. sell you like the plug to get in and mm. be a job and make. You know, not six figures a year. And he had got the job. He had been there. And I was trying to buy a job with him. It was like 5000 I got the biggest record in California at this time. Certified as big. It's big in Texas. It's big in California. It's huge with Akon. And I'm trying to buy a job because I'm like, okay, my time is going to come to an end. And I'm going to get up out this rap shit, fuck with these niggas. And I'm going to go get this job. And I'm going to have a family and do regular life. And God was just like, nah, bro, that ain't happening. You know what I'm saying? And 2011, as I started learning about hip hop and records and marketing and realized it was made specifically for people like me. Yeah. And once I realized that and God exposed that to me and I started seeing my place in it all, it just brought a different joy to my life. You know what I'm saying? It, it changed how I did it. It changed how I respected it. It changed how I spoke about it. It changed how I spoke. It's changing every day how people speak about me. Even the legends, even niggas, like every nigga. Like I look up and, you know, Ice Cube was mad, was mad at me. Ice Cube, who was probably mad at me when I was a, a young dude coming into the game versus him seeing me now and him following me and him knowing that I'm putting on and representing or Dub C liking certain posts on my Instagram or quick seeing that I'm really still making it happen and him being proud. That shit is everything. So not only did it change how I saw it, it changed how it all saw me. Yeah. So it definitely I feel like a crusader of preserving it and, and um, making sure the next generation of ghetto kids have the same outlet that I had. Because if we, if we keep letting it get away, you know what I mean? They'll just start putting white faces, you know, saying black things. Yeah, they trying it. <laughs> they yeah, hands trying, down. You they know trying all type of faces. That's why I just be slapping that shit down. And yeah. and it makes a certain certain people who I know fuck with me, they can't, they worried about fuck with me because they like, damn, this nigga challenging our money. And it's like, well, don't worry. Me challenging your money ain't going to end your money. But I got to preserve the next chance for the next ghetto generation to have that same outlet that like we've had for 40 years to help people express what's going on in our community and maybe make the next millionaires and be able to help their family. Like I need to keep it just a little bit longer so it don't become rock and roll. I fuck with that. Yeah. I fuck with that. Hip hop is like definitely like where it's at. Like culturally, it's like the eye of the storm. You know what I'm saying? It's where the shit is at. Uh, I think it's important for people, like you say, to want to do whatever they can to extend and kind of lock that shit down. Just to keep it for us, yeah. for the ghetto, a little bit longer. Yeah. Street urban culture personified through the arts. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, let's just hold it for the next generation of ghetto kids, one last generation. You know what I mean? That's my job. Let me take it. And, you know, obviously some people get put on the opposite end, but it's like, it's not going to stop you, bro. You're already rich. You're going for the 60 years of hip hop. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't want to look up the 60 years of hip hop look like 60 years of rock and roll. Yeah. Do you think hip hop is in a good place now? Culturally? I mean, well, yeah, it's right. It's under because, siege for because, sure. Because it's, under, it's getting gentrified. 
Right. So I, I'm grateful for the. It's crazy because I got to be grateful for Sexy Red. I'm like, shit, thank God. You know, <laughs> yeah, some, some, some somebody from St. Louis, some yeah. hood motherfucker putting on, you know, and she's young and still got growing and doing shit. But she'll grow like we all do when we get a couple dollars and our perspective get widened. But I love the rawness of it. I love what Glorilla does. I love what the women are doing in hip hop. I love what they doing. They it's a little bit of ghetto left. You know what I mean? Because. You know, these niggas, you know what I mean, they... And the women holding it down right now. Yeah, they the streetest thing going, popping it. You know what nice. I'm saying? So, yeah. um, I, I see it trying to be gentrified. And I hear some of the brothers trying to, you know, they don't get it. So, they're like, oh, you know, this person is cool. You tripping. No, I'm not tripping. You start letting this nigga, this type of motherfucker in here. Next thing we know, it's Kenny G. Hip-hop all day. Kenny G. <laughs> Kenny G a rap. Crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's just rock and roll, it's white, all white folks. It's, you know what I'm saying? Crazy. So, do you think hip hop always has to come from the streets for it to be authentic? Well, yeah, right. But it. So there are exceptions, right? But I don't think that should be the exception. Should become the rule. Thanks. There are some certain situations where you Rick Rubin. You know what I'm saying? Uh, there's some dope shit, but. That ain't the rule, bro. You not. <laughs> right. That's it. Cool. We got that. But no, that's not the rule, though. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It, the rule is it's from the ghetto. That's yeah. the rule. You know what I'm saying? There are exceptions, but let's let the exceptions be the exceptions. Okay. Man, how do you feel like, because I've been seeing this shit lately, like, for instance, like T.I. son or Michael Irvin son. Sure. Like, what do you think when you see them type of like upper class, middle class kind of people coming in and they black, but they misappropriate. Fuck, <laughs> <laughs> like, I was watching that shit yesterday. <laughs> King was probably told the guy, like, yeah, niggas, you niggas fit. King was, one thing I'm going to say about King is he passionate as fuck. He stand on business. Like he said, <laughs> nigga told his mom and daddy because he stand on business. Cause that little nigga crazy. Uh, T.I. grabbed him. Shout out to Tip, because Tip is a solid nigga, because that's my little good guy. Right. Um, but not to talk or comment about their parenting shit, because parenting shit is unique, but I mean, there is an attraction about the have-nots. Yeah. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Like, you know, this is a kid that could have been, you know, he could be inside his mansion with his parents <laughs> and shit, but he trying to go to the street. You know what that's mean? I mean? crazy. I think that's a bit... But again... Imaginative. But, but think yeah. about it, bro. Hip-hop is the last true beacon because of masculinity pure. Mm. Man, say that again. The last true beacon uh -huh. of masculinity pure. Mm, man, that's some wild shit. Masculinity and under siege, too. You feel me? So, yeah. like, hip-hop is the last thing where, like, the streets is like, you got to be a man here. Yeah, okay. You got to be accountable here. Like, there yeah. are some kind of rumor, like, if you don't take care of your kids, niggas, is cool. No, niggas, you's a bum to us, too. Facts. You, know, you don't take care of your kid, you bitch ass bum ass. Now, you might not say it all the time, but in the back, as soon as y'all start arguing, you're gonna make sure you tell his old bum ass, you don't even take care of your kid. Thanks, man. So, I mean, I think that you can have all these, it's funny because you can have all these millions of dollars, but you wanna be me. Yeah. You wanna be this. Yeah. And that just show you how hip hop, you know, street urban culture is, you know, the ultimate man. Don't matter, some nigga have. Niggas have $90 million and niggas are still trying to be this. Yeah. How you got $90 million still trying to be us? For sure. You know what I'm saying? So, so is guys like, is King Harris wrong for his approach to his expression? I mean, there's some genetics in him too. That's T.I.'s son. T.I. crazy as a motherfucker. T.I. and Tiny. T.I. got that little man syndrome. He tripping <laughs> and shit all the time. Nigga tried, nigga tried to fight Floyd Mayweather. You know how crazy you got to be to try yeah. to fight the greatest boxer ever? So I'm sure there's some DNA in there that got King tripping, but he'll find his way, bro. He, we always do. He get a pass? Uh, I don't know what pass he needs. <laughs> fucking T.I. son. I mean... Right, basically, yeah. Sure, like, like Mike Irvin's son is like... I don't quite know what their music is about for me to be commenting on it. You know what I mean? But um, they birthed into this shit. You know what I mean? It's like a homie that grew up like this. is a homie like me who my whole family ain't from the set. But then there's certain homies who their family is the the matriarch hood. You know, they the matriarch family of the set. It's like, nigga, you don't got to do the same. You born into it. And I think that's what. Uh, it's like a John Moran kind of thing, you know? 
Sure, where he's well, yeah, he's looking from the outside, trying to be in. But I think in in King's situation, if I was talking to little cousin, I would tell him like, you know, I don't quite understand. I mean, at this point, he's been at his grandma's house a lot of times, so he on some shit. But nigga, you born who you are. Like, you would never be some little white kid, Richie Rich, nigga. You ain't got to work. You Ti son, nigga. You Tiny son. You ain't got to. You still a nigga. You know what I mean? But I, again. Him standing on business, telling his parents he's standing on business is just retarded. <laughs> you got to get your shit together, little cousin. Not for real. That's too much. They say he embarrassing the family. Hey, well, how you going to tell your mom and dad you stand on business? People wipe your ass. They <laughs> looking at you crazy when you stand on business to them. <laughs> Man, it's forever. I notice it's like suburban black people, especially young ones. The I feel like the rule is that shit. Music is always, especially like hip hop, is always going to be the main orientation of who you are culturally. Like, regardless where you're from, you're black, what it means to be black is hip hop in a sense. That's what you're always gonna look to. You know what I'm saying? That's what I think, suburban or not, hood niggas. I think when you're a black dude, let's say you're a black dude from the suburbs, your parents, yeah, your parents might be from whatever, but when you look out into the world in America, your orientation of blackness is, is very rooted in hip hop. Well, I mean, that's in general, right? Yeah. Like, um, I had this conversation with my homeboy Trap from Queens yesterday, and I was telling him, hip-hop is an extension of slave culture, like soul food. Mm. Slave culture is always going to define black culture. You know what I mean? In America. Facts. You know what I mean? It, if you was a freedman in the 1600s, why the fuck would you be eating, you know, why would you be frying your chicken or eating greens when you could have a salad? If you was a black slaver in the 1600s, why the fuck, like, w what cultural would you have? Your culture can't just be how white people treat you. Because white people treat Irish people that way. White people treat Mexican people that way. So it can't just be how white people treat you. So I, I think, I think most culture always is going to be defined by its poorest people. Hmm. I just think that's the standard for culture in general. You know what I mean? Like, all Mexican people don't eat tacos. Tacos is some poor shit. Yeah. Spaghetti is created by poor people. I mean, ta uh, pizza is created by poor people in Italy. You yeah. know what I mean? P poor people pretty much are the centerpiece of culture. So just hip hop happens to be the voice of poor people for the most part. Yeah. In essence, culture is how you cultivate collectively. Sure. Like, but you but know what I'm if you're a wealthy person, a black person in Beverly Hills, then. You wouldn't have to, there's no need for culture. Like, why would you, why is lingo there if the education is great? Why would you buy cheap clothes? Like, there's no sense to take pride in cheap clothes because you can afford whatever clothes. Like, culture is still birthed out of necessity. Yeah, I agree. You know what I'm saying? Like, if, you, if you're wealthy in America, you do what the fuck you want to do. You can live like whatever. You could wear whatever you want to. And there's no burden. There's no responsibility. It's just like, do your thing. Yeah. It's a thin line. Um... That's a thin line, man, when it comes to that hip-hop shit with the culture, I think, as far as representing it. I don't know why it's just a thin line. It can be violated easily, meaning that, like, the pure representation of hip-hop, like, what is pure hip-hop can be violated easily. I don't know. Could it really? I think so. Like, I think even though it can be violated easily, I don't think it degrades what it is, meaning that, like, it could be misappropriated. It could be copied. It can, like... Business-wise, people influence it, like the waves, the trends. There's so many people with their hands on hip-hop. Is it really, though? But think about it. It still all comes from the street. Yeah, facts. Like, it's nothing a white person can do about hip-hop. That's, that's like, true. They're, they're, people think white people can start trends in hip-hop. They can't. Oh, they put their money in it. They can't make drill a trend right now. You don't think so? No. That's why, because they don't have no success. Hmm. There's some hot drill rappers. Uh, not really. Yeah. You think drill is dying out? It's dead. Okay. Like, you got New York people trying to appropriate it, but that's not going to work. You know what I mean? They're not going to be what Jay-Z was or DMX was or or um, they're not going to be what uh, LL Cool J was. So they just a bunch of kind of this middle class rap thing that we got going on where we got these middle class <laughs> hip hop artists that are just then really you didn't make it anywhere. You just made it good on your own shit. But um yeah, you will never be the, the voice of the movement itself. For sure, for sure. So um, I, I think I think drill had been dying ever since uh, 
Chop stopped doing it. Hmm. There's only two, the two dope producers from Jill. Remember, Dirk goes to Atlanta and start does like more of a trap thing. Mm -hmm. Moves to Atlanta and start being produced. Um, and then you got a couple other guys that's doing their thing, but that's that's more of an underground scene. It don't have the same effect like uh like Keith and Reese and all and Reese and them had. They don't it don't have the same effect that Chopping them was producing. Yeah, you're right. Even the video guys, the video guys had a, they own feel. Like that was a real movement. Yeah, true. Uh, man. Shout out to Glasses, who's always going to make sure the producers get their credit, man. Nah, man, you got to make sure the producers. <laughs> Shout out to Chop. Chop hard. Nah, Chop was that dude, man. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about this UK drill shit? I mean, it's just hard to have drill in a place that has no gun. I think they should have called it like <laughs> slash music. Them niggas be poking each other and slashing the shit out of each other. Facts. Them niggas be fucking each other up with knives Yeah, and they be shit. on that shit. I always thought that 21 Savage had that dagger. That, that's how I knew he was from England. <laughs> he had that little dagger in his face. Nah, for real, for real. That nigga, that's some English shit right there. They will stab your ass. Don't stab me, cuz. Facts. They used to, uh, I know that old hip hop scene, they used to call it grime. Yeah. That's, and see, that's what it is. So it's like, even in New York, like, that's buck fit. They open your motherfucking face up. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, some real street shit. Places where you can't have guns, you know what I'm saying? It's just weird to have drill, like, especially drill built on. Gun violence at uh, at this alarming rate. Out music. Yeah, England and shit, nigga. You caught with a gun over there, your ass ain't getting out for ten years. Never, for real, for real. Shit different. Um, if you could, if you could grade drill music currently today on a scale of one to ten, what would you give it? I wouldn't even grade it. It don't exist. Damn. It's just appropriation. Mm. I mean, I wouldn't really compare it like that. I wouldn't do it that way. For I sure. would compare. It you know, New York music as New York music, and then that way I wouldn't compare it to drill. Coming back from uh, so we was talking about that drill shit, yeah. But going further into like just the promotion of death and violence in hip hop, are you familiar with this guy named D One who's yeah. been you know kind of going on social yeah, media? Sorry, that's funny. <laughs> he was on Ross Head. Yeah, so it started like he been on a run for a few weeks, basically like. He been on this mission, but he's like charged up now. So basically it started with him singling out Rick Ross and Meek Mills for speaking on murder in their uh, their new single. Jim Jones, you could do better, brother. I love you too much. I love you too much to not be honest with you. Rick Ross, you could do better, brother. Meek Mill, you could do better, brother. I love you too much not to be honest with you. Are you the face of prison reform? Cause I held, uh, are you the face of prison reform? Or are you sitting here on your new song with Ross talking about getting somebody murked and shot at the red light? Which one is it, bro? Which one is it, bro? Cause I did a shoe giveaway in my city and gave out 1,300 pairs of your shoes cause they said reform underneath them. And I love that you partnered with, with a major shoe company and, and you out here pushing prison reform. But now I gotta sit here like, man, this man glorifying getting people killed as of a week ago. Like, what are you doing, bro? Lil Snoop really got killed. That broke your heart. You wear him around your neck. What, why are you glorifying the same thing when my best friend got killed? When Carl got killed, New Orleans know who I'm talking about. When Carl got killed and I had to go to his funeral and read the eulogy and be part of the funeral. And I got back in my car, Sway, after the funeral. And I turned on my music and I realized I'm listening to music that's glorifying the same stuff that just happened to my best friend. Mm. It gave me chills. And I needed that moment. That was my come to Jesus moment of like, D, you got to do something different, brother, because because you have a taste for this poison, but you, you're attracted to the poison. And rap is great. The rap game, hip hop industry is great at cooking up some delicious poison. How do you feel about what he's pushing? I really ain't up on D1 shit fully enough to flush it out. I think it's fucking interesting, though. He talking crazy, and I see he got Ross' attention. Um, I don't know. I think that's... I think it's a way to always kind of target poor black people. Mm. You know what I mean? Not him specifically, because Ross ain't poor, but I think there's this weird movement going on, and I'm not accusing D1 of it, where it's like, you understand niggas is at war. And it's easy to reduce down a war. It's no different than hippies in America, right? That don't want America to be at war. So it's people who are against kind of people bragging about surviving wars. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know. I kind of let them have their fight on their own. You know what I'm saying? I don't, I don't, I would have to sit down with him. When I sit down, you know, I'll probably do like a, a dope podcast. I got the No Sillings podcast on Black Effects. So 
Maybe I'll get D1 for a conversation and really flush out his thoughts because I don't really know where he stands with everything. I don't know quite what his beef is like or what, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I hear you saying this about something about somebody dying in songs, yeah. but I don't quite know. I need to know more to give an opinion on it. Yeah, he's definitely on a crusade, too. He pushes he's from New Orleans. He pushes like straight positive rap. He's got a lot of uh, biblical stuff attached to it. But then, you know, he's basically going, like a lot of people say it's still divisive. Even though you're talking positivity, a lot of people say it's still divisive. But he's going at rapper's neck like, oh, oh, you talking about murder and killing, and you, but you giving out turkeys? Oh, you talking about this and this? To niggas, yeah. the niggas, yeah. niggas, he's trying to, he niggas say he's, kill and die again. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but he said he's, he's, he's trying to draw a line in the stand for the first time in hip hop. For the long, first time in a long time. I don't know if it's about just being positive because the Bible ain't all positive. Okay. So um, I don't know, but you know what? I'm glad you you brought it up. I'm definitely gonna try to get with him and really pick his brain and see where he at with it. Yeah. You know what I mean, because I don't really know, but I seen his name and I seen he had that shit going with Ross where he kind of singled out Ross and Meek Mill. Yeah. But I'm sure it's more to his list. I just don't know. Yeah, he's accomplished. All I, I I I really don't fuck with niggas who be just talking about that positive rap shit or. Yeah. If your shit positive, that's cool, but you can't really be upset if other people see the, yeah. you know, are are talking about what's going on that's bad in the community or things you don't agree with. Yeah. I mean, I guess you can still, too. So I got to get more into it. I got to talk to him and I'll see from there. No, for sure. He definitely is one of them hip-hop niggas who's, who wants to reach out and connect with people. So that will be dope. Charlotte, I'll make sure and I'll tell him you put me up on him. So when sure. you reach out for him, this motherfucker, then I sit down with you. <laughs> nah, for real. Yeah. Man, uh... Shit, moving on, I got to make sure I talk about this, though. Because uh, especially lately, you got to talk about that song, the Tupac song. Oh, Tupac Must Die. Tupac Must Die. It came out, uh, like, about four or five years ago? Four years? Four years ago, 2019. Yeah. And basically, in that song, you kind of, like, entail the unwritten details of what happened the night Tupac died. I, I like to uh, think of it as me telling the street side of the story. Yeah, for sure. What uh what inspired you to do that? Hip hop is all about telling the streets side of the story. Yeah. So you just felt like that story needed to be told at that time. It wasn't about timing as much as it was about the idea came to me at the time. Um and it was right when I, I really finally got a grasp on hip hop. I got a grasp on marketing, right? I started understanding that the world has to care about the topic for you, for them to care about perspective. Um, it just was time and it was time. It wasn't like I had the idea like eight years before it and just held it. Um, it just came to me at that time. And as I realized hip hop was telling the streets side of the story, I always thought like as a crip, like I knew the world knew I was a crip. Um, the world knew I was a crip. So, they would respect me telling a crip story and what's the biggest the biggest things that involve crips that people don't know their perspective you know what i'm saying and that's one of the biggest things uh the death of tupac shakur um the start of the 92 93 los angeles riots um there's only so many things that involve a crip that the world know about I mean, I got a couple of other ideas that, that have came to me since then, but I'm, I'm thinking about making them a rap. Mm. Yeah, that's dope. That's dope. Um, and, of course, the song is from the perspective of the person who allegedly killed. Yeah, he was, he's a Southside Compton crib. Yeah. For sure. Man, what do you know, you know, coming from Compton and Watts, what do you know about the Southside Compton Crips? Good like, dudes, man. Historically. Good brothers, man. They always had money growing yeah. up. They wasn't no poor niggas. Yeah, for sure. That kind of set them apart as far as being a set, just having that money and shit. Yeah, because it means they didn't have to be friendly with everybody. They probably had a lot more, you know, issues with other Crips a lot sooner than other Crips did. Yeah. You know, um, at least I would imagine. But they was always known to have money. They wasn't poor. They wasn't like uh, other gangs. They had some motherfucking money. For sure. Uh, Man, they was like really them dudes. Like, you know, they was having money. They was connected with industry dudes. Do you ever think like what happened with them and Tupac kind of left a blemish on uh, LA's like music scene a little bit? Hell no. No? Nah. Helped it? Well, it just makes it it just brings a validity to the conversations. 
You know, it, it, it creates a standard of like nobody's above the program, not even one of the most beloved hip hop artists historically. The old man is above the program in Los Angeles, not even within the culture itself. No man's above the program. You got to really treat everybody with a level of respect here. You got to know where you at. You can't just be flossing on people. You know what I mean? You can't be wearing these big chains. You know what I mean? It's, shit will go bad. You know what I mean? You can't just mistreat anybody. This is really the wild, wild west because it'll go bad fast. Yeah, for sure. Historically, L.A. has yeah, had that reputation. It's going to live up to its reputation almost every time. Yeah, for sure. It's just one of them things. It is what it is. Yeah, and it's, it's sad because obviously, you know, Tupac is one of the guys that everybody loved. We all loved as far as the black folks, you know what I'm saying? But it's like, um, you know, a bad situation happened. And, and the same thing that happens to my friends happened to one of the world's greatest hip hop artists. Yeah. You know what I mean? If, you, if, if respect is not carried out and you, you know, you mistreat somebody and you don't deal with their reputation and, and who they are correctly, it could go bad. And I mean, I think he knew what was going on. There's this belief that he didn't know, and I don't believe that's true. You say Tupac didn't know? Yeah, there's a belief that Tupac just didn't know. He got involved with something he didn't understand. I don't think that's really what it was. I think he was committed to his friends the way we be committed to our friends. Yeah. And that's kind of what happens sometimes. And basically, he kind of got out of line. I don't think got out of line. He did what he thought he had to do. Right. So if somebody took my homeboy chain, I might rest their stupid ass too. You know what I mean? Like, but again, it's one of them things where you know it come, it don't stop sometimes. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's just rough. Um. Yes. When you made that song, you kind of felt like that's the streets of LA already always kind of knew what happened. And it was yeah. just like kind of like a, I guess a, you know, like a, a coming sigh out of party. relief kind of. You know like a saying? coming out party. Yeah. Like it, it definitely created a, a sense of relief to people within the culture. You know what I mean? It definitely gave them, uh, uh, it made them more comfortable. Like, damn, I'm glad somebody told this person's story. And, you know, people were saying this person was broke and he was just some kind of villain or heathen. Man, this nigga wasn't a horrible person. He was just a, a, a really... A, a young dude surviving. He's two years younger than Tupac. Yeah. You know what I mean? Surviving these crazy streets and trying to keep his reputation sound so he can earn and, you know, have value for himself like anybody else from any other ghetto. It's just, you know, we take our reputation really serious around here and it could get bad. It did. Real shit. Speaking on reputation and you was talking about how California, L.A. has a certain reputation. Uh, even going back to Dan, but when you look at like PNB Rock or people, I've even seen when Deion Sanders' team got robbed at UCLA. Sure. Like people say that that about LA, like, yeah, it's like that. Why do you think it is? Do you feel like, because people say like, oh yeah, especially in the rap game, careful when you go out there, they be looking for it type of shit. Is it like that? Yeah, nobody bigger than a program. Mm -hmm. No man's bigger than a program. You come out here big wigging and shit, it could go bad. You, know, you just got to kind of keep your shit together. Remember, you a regular person around this motherfucker. I don't give a fuck who you is. You be the biggest gang member in the world, not just rapper. You could be the biggest gang member in the world in Los Angeles, and you end up in somebody's community, and some regular nigga blow your fucking head off. That's from over there. You know what I mean? Um, this is the wild, wild west, and no man is bigger than a program. Not nobody. And if you know that, you'll be fine in Los Angeles. That'll be the reason why you don't go to some poor community wearing entirely too much jewelry because you understand that motherfuckers will take you down a pig. Plus, they poor. Real shit. Real shit, man. I got to talk about this new music. That song definitely we talked about was a classic, but I got to talk about this, this new shit we yeah, got right Cancel here. these nuts. Cancel these nuts. Now, grab that at thecrypstore.com. T H E C R I P S T O R E. Thecrypstore.com. Okay, yeah. At thecrypstore.com. For sure. Grab that. So, you selling the physical copies? Yep. Vinyls. All that shit. Cassettes. Cassette USBs. Rest in peace to G.I. Joe from 60s. No, That's for sure. his idea. Hell yeah. What you got merch too at the uh Crypt store? Yeah, there's some there's some stuff over there. Oh there's some yeah. stuff over there. That's dope, man. I love the artwork on this shit. Yeah. I I'm a I'm a CD head. I grew up snatching the CD over and reading the book, so I love to see this shit. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? What would you say the song on this new new uh matter of fact, before we go into the songs, the title. 
Cancel these nuts. Let's let's get some understanding on that. Cancel these nuts is just about that. I'm gonna say what I want to say. Nobody owns me. You know what I mean, I don't. Pepsi can't control what I say. You know, Coke can't control what I say. And ain't nothing nobody really could do about it but squabble me. You know what I'm saying? And I know the only thing you can cancel is these nuts. It be your mouth. You That's the only thing. Man, do you believe, like, cancel culture really exists or not? It's just... Hell yeah. Okay. Yeah, I believe it. For sure. Yeah, you know I mean, I think what happens is they start putting pressure on people that's financing your existence. But I think they can only cancel you when they made you. Hmm. That's another thing. Yeah. Like if you if you making all your money from their festivals and their endorsements and and streaming, they could fuck with you. They'll terrorize your ass, you know what I mean? They'll start taking all that shit away. But like me, the streets made me. You know what I mean? It don't matter which streets I ever been to, I always got the same love. So Yeah. Ain't nothing they could do with me. You know what yeah. I mean? All they could do is wait to eventually get down with me. That's it. They can only wait to try to, to fuck with me. I wouldn't even do some of those. Uh, uh, clauses that they have, those uh, morality clauses. If I can't be the loke, then I can't represent your product. Yeah. Having the uh, support from the streets, you think that benefits the longevity in the game? I think being a representative of the streets creates true longevity in the game. Yeah. Continuously representing the ghetto's interests. You know what I mean? And the day you not is the day you shouldn't be talking about you fucking hip hop. Yeah. Whenever you start being about you and not us, that's the day it's over for you. Don't even call yourself a hip-hop artist. Call yourself a pop artist. That's a lot of that going on in the game, though. That's why a nigga be saying. That's yeah. why I be on them. Like, nigga, that nigga is not hip-hop. If it's about you and it's not about us, yeah. it's no longer hip-hop. Hip-hop is that one movement left where it's about us, not just about you. It's that uh, FUBU effect like a motherfucker. Yeah, you got to put on. Yeah. Hip-hop is all about putting on, and you got to put on. Yeah. How do you feel about subgenres? Like, is it at a point where some of this stuff definitely needs to not be called hip hop? I think most of it is not hip hop. Um, like, you take Lil Uzi, I think he makes rock music. Okay. I think we keep trying to say he's hip hop. That nigga done told us a hundred times he a rock star. You know, he just features on hip hop songs sometimes. So we like, oh, he raps and he's black from Philly, so he's a hip hop artist. Man, that nigga's a rock star. Yeah. I, I support him embarking on his journey to reclaim rock and roll for black people. Hmm. Um, I, I think know. Travis Scott calls his music uh, rage music. Yeah. You know I mean, you wouldn't call trans hip hop. So why would you call rage music hip hop? Because he's rapping or he's using melody. Like, man, let these dudes create their own spaces to exist. I agree with that. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And they're telling you, they're not saying they're hip hop. They're going out their way to tell you they're not hip hop or they're not claiming hip hop. Because I don't think the streets is really the influence in their music. I don't think that's the group of people they represent. Yeah. And I think it's important to allow you know black creatives to not box them in if that's not the box they want to be in. Hmm. Now, for sure, I agree with it. I think that lumping everything into uh, lumping everything into like hip hop basket kind of degrades the value of real hip hop and the new shit too. Yeah. Like, like um. Even further, yeah, the, the point you're making, like, why Uzi can't be rock music? Why why is, why is I want to rock not rock music? We defined it. We created it. I'm claiming that. I want to rock is a modern-day rock song. Why the fuck can't that black man, that black kid go out and reclaim rock music? Yeah. That's what he told me. He a rock star. You know yeah. what I mean? For well, sure. Why, uh, why is it that you think everybody's always... Push to be lumped in that group. Because I, I see most of it as pop music. Because anybody black that rap is hip hop. Anything with a beat and a black person, they just. It's like the yeah. niggas just rapping. Old <laughs> niggas. Old niggas got some more of that hippity hop music out there. That little Uzi nigger is a hippity hop artist. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? A little Uzi, a little nigger. But no, nah, I definitely think, I think when you go to an award show, I think you should be able to get an award for that. What you, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think hip hop should have what it is because you can't compare everything. Yeah. Anytime somebody black and rap, they got to be one of them hippity hop niggas. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if it was one thing to change in the rap game, if you could change in the rap game, that would probably be one of the biggest things? Or what would be the, the first thing you would change if you could change something in rap? Get back to giving producers deals and make producers sign rappers. Yeah. 
That's the first thing. Make good music. Got to get back to making better music. Records yeah. <laughs> got to get better. Right? This shit's whack. Yeah, you think the music level is going down? I mean, the shit. low vibration level? I ain't gonna get that for. I just think it's by underdeveloped producers. Yeah. They still babies in the thing. You know what I mean? So it's just work. But I think music is hip hop is in a bad space as far as musically because it's not being led by the producers anymore. It's being led by rappers, and these niggas don't know shit about nothing. Rappers and business people. Yeah, yeah. niggas is marketing and a bunch of niggas marketing. Niggas is marketing and white people that's marketing, but not one having a real care about the actual sound of what's going on. So I would get back to giving deals to people like Marley Marr and all these people that make records and you know, are producers, you know what I mean? The new dudes, Take Keith. Why don't Take Keith have a label? Yeah. Like Take Keith should, Sexy Red should be signed to Take Keith because Take Keith is yeah. making all their shit. Even like how Glorilla pop with the yeah, uh, yeah. like I, I was telling my homeboy that that A and R over there at uh at, at Gotti label like why we don't have a DJ Paul produce Sexy Red collab album. Yeah, that's it. You know, you want to take her to another level? Let DJ Paul do a whole album on Sexy Red. That shit'll fuck the world up. Yeah, you know what I mean, and, and we just got it like like when Dre and Snoop and them came in. Them niggas was using the dramatics on songs and and George Clinton and Parliament and Roger and Zap and all them niggas on songs. Man, that's what Sexy Red and them, they got to go get with DJ Paul and let's bring this shit together and take the world back by storm while we still got it. Because in a minute, this motherfucker be completely gentrified. Yeah, yeah man, I feel It'll you. be over. I feel you, man. So I, the, the major thing that I would get back is... Record companies giving deals to producers and producers signing artists. Yeah. Get back to that. You know what yeah. I mean? When you went in the studio, you didn't tell Dre nothing. Snoop just listen. Nigga, I'll just, I got the rest of this, nigga. You just let me do this. Yeah. They make each, each person's part a little easier. It's a story I always heard about how Manny Fresh and Bird and them worked on the 400 Degrees album. You know what I mean? It was like they did the work. Yeah. I want to get back to that type of shit, them 400 Degrees and them doggy styles and them albums from these kids, from this era in culture. Yeah. I want that DJ Paul and Glorilla record, like that Glorilla album. I'm a make, I'm a.